Hello and welcome to Calamo Church. My name is Pastor Dale and this is our weekly online sermon. This week we're going to be starting a series called How to Study the Bible and it's only a two-parter. Uh, we're going to be looking at the book of Philemon and uh, this is really a beginner's guide to studying the Bible. But before we get into studying the Bible and learning how to do that, let us open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can come here today, that we can learn how to read your word and understand it, that we can learn how to take the Bible and shape it to our lives. Please open our hearts and minds, guide and direct us today as we fellowship with one another, with your church, with your kingdom throughout the world. In your name we pray. Amen. So, if, if you really want to get to know God, there's no greater way to get to know God's character, his nature, his goodness, the life he has for you, than reading his word to you, the Bible. I, I can spend so much time learning and studying about the Bible, and a lot of people do. Yet, most people don't. Some don't care. Some think it doesn't apply. It's a waste of time. Others try to read. They get confused, and they get bored and give up. And the problem is, I think a lot of us might want to, but we don't know how to. But we don't know where to start. And there's a few ways we start. I feel like most people do one of two things. You do the, all right, well, here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to sit down, we're going to start at Genesis, and we're going to read all the way through. And that's what I did. Except most people get through Genesis, they get Exodus, they get to Leviticus and then they're done with that method. And I'm I'm not laughing. Like I I understand how dense and difficult Leviticus can be. The other one can be, you know, the lucky dip method. Uh you just open the Bible, you put your finger on a verse and you apply it to your life. Yeah, except if you do that, you could end up with somewhere like Ezekiel 4:12. And it where the verse says, and you shall eat it as a barley cake, baking it in their sight on human dung. Yeah, it really doesn't, the, uh, the, the lucky dip method really isn't the best method. Uh, what this series is and what it's meant to be, my goal is to help you learn how to study the Bible. And to do that, we're going to be looking at a short book in the New Testament, Philemon. Um, if, if you want to get a way of how to say Philemon or Philemon, it's probably not Philemon, it's more like Philemon. Philemon, Jan, you know, say it however you want. I Just call him John if you really want to. But Philemon, Philemon, Philem, wow, I've said it so many times, it's messing with my brain. Um, I, I'm excited for this one because... This one shows how the word of God is living, it's active, it's powerful, it speaks to you, it guides you, it protects you, it empowers you, it can guard you from temptation, renew your mind, build your faith, show you heavenly riches. It can. It, the, there's a reason why the Bible says the truth shall set you free. You don't want to miss out on God. And in order to do that, we're going to look at five steps on how to study the Bible. You want to choose a translation you understand. Choose a time, a place, and a plan to study. You want to understand the context. You want to read slowly and ask questions. And you want to pray for God to speak to you and apply what he shows you. And we're going to start with a verse from Philemon here. one verses seven, Chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. And I want to really nail home this first point, that you need to choose a translation you understand. So I'm going to read to you the King James Version. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, though I might be bold in Christ to enjoy thee, that which is convenient. Did you get that? Uh, you know, it's fine. Uh, just know that the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Uh, this is the King James Version. And you might ask yourself, why do we have different 
translations of the Bible. Why can't we all just decide on one translation? Well, here's the thing. The original Bible isn't written in one language. It's written in three. It's written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And when you translate languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek being three, sometimes the direct translation is not always what is meant. Languages are developed out of culture. They're developed out of centuries or millennia of understanding, shared understanding of a cultural group. There's phrases we use in English that wouldn't make sense if translated into other languages. The slang terms we use, the colloquialisms, and some things we say, and we don't mean it literally, we mean it, you know, figuratively. Now, the King James Version was meant to do a couple things. It was meant to be both a poetic translation and a more literal translation. It was also written in 1611. And uh, if you're familiar with the English language, not only do other languages change or, and have different meanings, the English language in the last 400 years has developed into something that would be almost unrecognizable to early modern English speakers. Because that's what the King James Bible was written in. It was written in early modern English wasn't Middle English, that would be a whole different mess. But you need to understand that there are different versions, and they all try and get out at, at different things. You know, when the King James Version says the bowels of the saints, what they're really saying is the felt emotions, the heart, the intent bowels meaning that feeling in the pit of your stomach and if you can understand that when you read it that's fine and you can use the translation that is the king james version not everyone chooses that uh, i use when i'm doing my research when i'm doing my studying i use a bible app called you version there's like three thousand translations of the bible on that some in different languages but also you know you have your niv your, your new international version, your the New Living Translation, the NLT, the New King James Version, the English Standard Version. There's so many different versions. And it's helpful to understand where these translations come from, how they developed, what their intent is, what they're, what they're trying to get at. But it is also important to choose a translation you understand. And also know how that translation came about. So, the second thing you're going to want to do is choose a time, a place, and a plan to study. You want to be consistent with this. That's how you do it. Um, the time and place, a lot of people uh, like to do it in the morning. That's when it's a good time. You're waking up, you get that in your heart, you're studying the Bible, find a chair or a table, you can do it the same my apologies i have not had coffee yet at the time of recording this um you can do it at the same time and place you can do it at a chair or a table i i don't do mornings for bible study because as you just saw i would probably fall right back to sleep i need a cup of coffee i need to get moving get energized so i typically um do my daily devotion around uh shortly after work so whenever, when I get out of work is variable, but that's when I do it. And you can have it on paper, you can have it in digital, you can have a plan, you can go through a book, you can have a devotion. Uh, the Version app I mentioned has Bible study plans. It, it, whatever you need, whatever you want, that's how you do it. But you want to be consistent. That's the key. Choose a time and a place and a plan. You're going to get at it and you're going to keep at it. Three, and this is might be the most the most important um, the most important one. You need to understand the context. Now, understanding context is 
important, and I can illustrate why. Um, so what would you think if I was to, or if you were my friends, and just randomly on Facebook or Instagram, there was a photo of me um, with a woman who is not my wife having dinner alone in a totally different city. Um, what would you think of that? Well, and well, I don't have a wife, but not my girlfriend, but uh, it might raise concern. You know, what is what is going on? What is what is this person who who is this person? Well, one of my best friends uh, from the last ever since I moved to where I live now, moved to Canada. If I want to go visit them, there's a good chance there will be a photo of me having dinner alone in a different city. And while my girlfriend understands this, while um, people in my life might understand that, if you were just following me on social media and all of a sudden it's like, hey, this girl is different. There's an incomplete context there. And that's why understanding the context is so important. Context matters more than you can imagine. Because it helps us to understand. The interesting thing about the Bible is it's not necessarily a book. It's more like a library. It, was a, it is a collection of 66 different books in the common Protestant Bible. It is written in three languages, like I mentioned earlier. It was written across three continents. Europe, Africa, and Asia. It was written over a 1,500-year time period. And it was written by over 40 different authors, ranging from shepherds, farmers, doctors, fishermen, priests, philosophers, and kings. It is a collection of poems, prophecies, letters, laws, histories, and biographies written by people and inspired by God, telling one unified story that shows us our need for Jesus and teaches us to become like him. To study the Bible, to understand it, to apply it to today, context matters. Context is always going to matter. You, have to, you want to know who wrote it. To whom was it written? What is its purpose? Because those things can change how we're viewing something. And the reason why Philemon, Philemon is a great place to do this is when you understand the context, it can change how we understand stuff. Philemon verses one, or chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, a dear friend and fellow worker, and to the church that meets in your home. Now, you get a bit of context there. Paul, a prisoner of Christ, Timothy, brother, Philemon, friend and worker. He has a church that meets in his home. But there's more context. And you don't have to do all the studying necessarily on your own. Get some extra resources. That Bible app I mentioned, I checked. There's like a dozen studies on Philemon already there. Um, commentary, Bible software, Bible videos. There's all kinds of stuff that can help you get context. context. But... Uh, Paul wrote this letter, obviously. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. This is his shortest letter. Philemon is the shortest. Um, he, and he says prisoner of Christ here. Normally he addresses himself as an apostle, but he says prisoner of Christ. He's not pulling rank. He's talking to a friend. Philemon was written by Paul from a Roman prison to a wealthy man named Philemon who led a church in his home. That is the basis of context. But there's more. It was written about On Onismus, a runaway slave who had stolen from Philemon. Onismus met Paul in Rome, and Paul led Onismus to Christ. Paul's purpose was to encourage Philemon to forgive Onismus and accept him as a brother in Christ. So, this is why research is important, because when he's writing this letter, it's a big deal. And 
in my research, I found like there were about 60 million slaves in Rome at its peak. When a slave runs away, at the very least, would try and get that slave back. They would brand that slave. They'd label them a fugitive. Sometimes they would beat and kill that one for running away. And what Paul's going to say is this guy who stole from you, who escaped, I want you to forgive. I want you to receive and treat Anismus not as a slave, but as an equal. And understanding the context here, Paul is starting by buttering up Philemon. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the people. Paul is buttering up Philemon because he knows what he's about to get to. Philemon, you're so loving. You know what to do. You know what is right. And now we have some context. Remember that next verse where it says, you know, we have great joy and consultation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Yeah, that's more buttering up. You are such a great person. You've done so much for Christ. You refresh us. We love hearing about you. So now we've got that context. Now what do we do? We read slowly and we ask questions. What does this say about God? What does this say to me? And I would use SPEC here. It's an acronym, but it's, is there a sin to be avoided? Is there a promise to be claimed? Is there an example to be followed? Is there a command to obey? Is there something to know about God? And we'll get, we'll get more on this next week, and it will blow your mind. But that is, so those are some questions to ask. What is going on here? Sin, promise, example, command, knowledge. Find those things. So you're going to choose a translation you understand. You're going to choose a time, a place, a plan. You're going to understand the context, and you're going to read slowly and ask questions. And finally, you're going to pray to God that you're going to pray for God to speak to you and apply what he shows. You're going to pray, God, what do you want me to see in this? Say to me, what do you want to show to me? Philemon chapter 1 verses 8 through 10 says, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. As it is as none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in change. chains. Onesimus stole from Philemon. He runs to Rome. He meets Paul. Paul led Onesimus, a slave to Christ. Now Onesimus is not a slave, but a son. And this is when I say we can go deeper. We can look at the original language. You can, if you're a nerd like I am, you can Google the Greek, these buried treasures, these little Easter eggs. Onesimus' name, it means useful or prof profitable. Onesimus. Formerly, Onesimus was useless to you, but now he has become useful to both you and me. It's verse 11 there. Formerly, pote. But now, de nuni. Pote de nuni. That's, you can't have the de nuni without the pote. You can't have the but now without the formerly. Formerly, Onesimus was a slave and useless, but now he's useful. Your life formerly painful, but now profitable. Instead of and here's the application, because you're reading this, and instead of asking God why, you can ask God what? What is God showing you? Think back. How God used you. Maybe when you didn't want to. Maybe when you didn't think you were useful or good. If God is faithful, you can turn hard times into good times. You trust him with your pain today. 
What does God want to show you? Well, if I was reading this, I would say, well, you can't have a de nuni without the pote. You can't have a but now without the formerly. That's what God revealed to me in that. God is writing your story as you speak. You were formerly sick, but now you've been healed. You were formerly addicted, but now you've become sober. Sober. You were formerly anxious and depressed. Now you found peace. You were formerly, uh, your marriage was hanging in the balance, but now you're seeking God. Formerly you were lost, but now you are found. When will he rewrite your story? As soon as you read his word. The word of God is living, active, powerful. It speaks to you. It guides you. It protects you. It empowers you. It guards you from temptation. It renews your mind. It builds your faith. It shows you heavenly riches. God's word is truth, and truth will set you free. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and for your blessing of the Bible into our lives. Let us seek to read it, to understand it, the context, the history, and let us seek to understand what you would have us to learn from it, Lord. Let us pray to you. Let us search you, Lord, in all that we do, in all that we pray, in all that we are. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Have a great week, all.